Good morning, my name is Eric Anderson and welcome to Sport Forum uh, Results 2020. The key pillars of work in 2020 were sustainable PCN strategy for seed production, top-down cultivation, IPM potivirus control using mineral oils and wildflower strips, and a desiccation philosophy. PCN cysts resulting from female nematodes contain approximately 400 live eggs and so have a massive potential for reproduction. These cysts are spread by adhering to potatoes, which are then planted or moved through the soil, either attached to potatoes used as farm seed seed or as machinery. And the potential for movement by water and by wind is also there. Nematode eggs can survive in cysts for up to 40 years, thereby effectively taking out of seed and bulb production the land for a significant amount of time once potato cyst nematodes have been identified as being infested in the land if no mitigation is undertaken. There are two species of PCN present in Scotland, Globidera rostockiensis, the golden cyst nematode, and Globidera pallida, the white cyst nematode. In the 1970s, Globidera pallida represent 2-3% to of potato findings, with Globidera rostockiensis representing the rest. In recent years, however, the incidence of Globidera pallida has increased markedly, and statutory testing uh, using the data collected by SASA shows that the area of land recorded as infested with Globidera pallida is currently 6,200 hectares and is doubling every 78 years, and now accounts for nearly 70% of findings. SASA estimates that 13% of land regularly planted with potatoes in Scotland is now infested with PCN, and an estimated increase in the spread is an order of 5% per year. The widespread presence of Globidera pallida and spread onto land historically used for seed production is particularly acute, since land infestations with PCN by statute cannot be used to grow potato seed. The increasing importance of PCN was highlighted by a working group set up by Scotland's Plant Health Centre in June 2020 to identify a clear strategy for dealing with the PCN crisis. This working group put together a range of proposals in December 2020, which hopefully will be considered, approved and funded by the Scottish Minister for Rural Affairs and Natural Environment, Ben McPherson. PCN is already having a major effect on farm businesses and is particularly hitting the potato, seed and bulb sectors hard, where certified PCN free land is required to grow their crop. With the movement of machinery from field to field and the lack of resistant varieties, the number of infested fields is only likely to increase. Now, one of the key recommendations from the report was to preserve the land for future generations. This could be achieved by creating special status for land found to be free of PCN upon statutory soil sampling, create new incentives or conditional use of existing incentives for keeping the soil free from PCN, and a statutory land retesting for to free up land for PCN uh, using resistant varieties upon production and extend the use of diagnostics for PCN management. Where PCN has been identified, it's proposed to make available a range of tools and actions for land managers for the long-term sustainable control and management of PCN in soils aligned with the government's IPM ambitions. And this could be facilitated by improving use of decision support systems and the development and testing of integrated pest management tools. Now, a large proportion of potato production, both where and seed production is on rented land. Using an analogy, most people understand that they have to pay for accidental damages to their own car and drive very carefully. But how much more aggressively do people drive a rented car with no excess and a collision waiver? In reality, there are always consequences for our actions, however far we are removed from them. Presently, regarding PCN, there is a lack of consequences for poor, poor PCN management, particularly on rented land. Biosecurity considerations are often a low priority. Groundkeeper control is key and a loss of glyphosate will exacerbate the problem. 
and land is scheduled commonly in four hectare blocks in a blanket approach. Identifying localised infestations would allow the reinstatement of buffer strips and aggressively targeting of the remainder of the land parcel found to be free from PCN by using resistant varieties. Let us choose to be empowered. Denying there is work to be done is not sustainable. We could choose to be accountable for our own actions and we could acknowledge the reality. We could own the problem and we could find solutions and we could all make this happen. The decline of PCN in a field has two components. One is natural mortality from causes such as parasitism and the second is from spontaneous hatching of a proportion of the eggs in each year, the juveniles from which will die if they fail to find a host. The rate of decline for a Globodera pallida in the UK is typically around about 20%, slower than that of Globodera restockiensis at 30%. The decline increases as soil temperature rises and decline is fastest in sandy soil and slower in silt, clay or organic soil. But the natural decline in land infested with volunteers is negated as the population increases 70 or 100 fold from low populations in the presence of a potato plant. Additionally, late blight primary inoculum for the following year is locally generated and spread. So reducing the initial frequency of initial late blight clones on volunteers within the environment could have a major effect on the success of resistant management strategies for blight and with relation to virus, Past work conducted by Scotch Agronomy on behalf of HDB potatoes found that 10 of the most common varieties found as groundkeepers in Scotland were known to have a high propensity for PVYN. Now, this is the current statutory sampling rates uh, in, in Scotland, and you can see that when a field is found to be infested, that the whole sampled area is then subject to restrictions that will be a minimum of two hectares, but frequently statutory soil sampling is conducted in three, four or five hectare parcels of, of, of land. So often a detectable PC infestation now is a result of what happened over the past 30 or 40 years. The threshold of detection in a 1500 mil sample per hectare is over 3.8 million cysts per hectare. Thus a negative result should be interpreted as not found. Rotation has a big effect. A three-year rotation is in the blue and a six-year rotation is in green on the chart here. The threshold for detection on a three-year rotation is arrived at after 12 years, but on a six-year rotation, it's closer to 30 years. Much of the findings of PCN is a legacy of the previous management. The flip side is that unless proactive action is taken across the whole industry, findings of PCN will continue to rise exponentially in the next six to seven years. The probability of finding PCN in a sample can vary greatly depending on a couple of factors. Assuming that a central focus has a population density of 100 cysts per kilogram and therefore contains 1.5 million cysts, similarly, a focus with a central population of 50 cysts per kilogram contains 0.75 million cysts. Therefore, a field with one large focus and three smaller ones will contain 3.8 million cysts. Now, the big question is how detectable are these 3.8 million cysts? Well, that depends on the volume of soil you sample. At the standard rate of 1500 mils per hectare, you have a 92% chance of detection. On a non-statutory 400 mil sample, it will give you a 52% chance of detection. And if you were to submit your sample to a laboratory analyzing a 200 mil subsample, then the detection rate reduces to just 30%. Assuming that we were sampling to detect PCN proactively, then we are looking for greater than 90% probability of detection for a single focus with a population of 1.5 million cysts a five litre per hectare sample would give us a 90% chance of detection. And if we were to sample 10 litres per hectare, there's a greater than 90% chance of detecting populations of just 0.75 million cysts. Although in the absence of a host, the probability of detecting cysts will not normally change over a six year period, 
there is an, ad an advantage to the grower to sample following the potato crop if after the potato crop you can sample 10 litres and detect a population of 0.75 million cysts, a fifth of the detection of a statutory test. And you would have another five years in that rotation to manage that infested land bank with a variety of methods, such as trap cropping, biofumication, chitinous compost before it comes to the next potato crop and the next statutory test. Now, the AHDB spot farm, uh, we undertook uh, a statutory uh, PCN test in the spring of 2019. And as you can see here, there were two parcels, one four hectare and one five hectare that were found to be infested and therefore were scheduled and were precluded from growing seed potatoes. Following the production of potatoes in 2019, we resampled the whole field after harvest and it was intensively sampled at 10 litres per, per hectare. The results of these samples you can see here in front of us, and there was only one hectare strip that had nine viable cysts. The rest were found to be free from any uh, PCN live cysts. There were two hectare strips adjacent to each other which contained non-viable cysts. And it's interesting to note, and perhaps we'll get the opportunity in discussion to look at the, uh, the reason of why there was PCN in those uh, two, two strips and how that got into that field in the first instance. In a further example in the real world where 28.99 hectares was statutory sampled, you can see that three by four hectare blocks were, were scheduled, but there were only four by one hectare blocks where any live PCN cysts were, were, were found. Now, it's interesting to note that a revised PCN control directive came into force on the 1st of July 2010, so that's over 10 years ago. The aim of this directive was to strengthen and harmonise controls against PCN, taking account of changes in the understanding and biology of the pest, its distribution and practices within the potato industry. Buffer zones were abandoned in Scottish sampling at this point in time, however, they continued to use them in PCN management in the Netherlands. And you can see here the, uh, the further uh, structure that is used in the Netherlands if there are two uh, groups of buffer zones relatively close together, the distance between two infestations, including the buffer zone, must be at least 27 metres in, in Holland. Now, the components of an integrated PCN control programme, giving the potential for reproductive rate of PCN nearly 100 fold, management tools must, in theory, be 98% effective to present population increases. But in reality, a combination of tools are required to produce effective management programme. Sampling soil to detect the presence of PCN and, if confirmed, determine the PCN species and the population because this will influence the choice of management options available. By sampling immediately after the preceding potato crop, you have five or six years to undertake actions. Let's choose to be empowered. Let's stop denying there's work to be done because it's not sustainable. And we need to own this problem. We have solutions. We now need to make a difference and make it happen. Now moving topics on to um, climate change, uh, cultivations and carbon footprinting. Evidence is building from a new Scottish agriculture policy developing from several of these documents. Carbon auditing, the UK will host the United Nations COP26 conference in Glasgow between the 1st and 12th of November 2021. And the UK will aim to cut its carbon emissions by at least 68% of where they were in 1990 by the end of 2030. The government will use this opportunity to build momentum for the repurposing of agricultural subsidies, subsidies to protect and enhance our biodiversity and build resilience against climate change across agriculture, land use, food and, and environment systems. Domestically, reaching our net zero target is one of the government's top priorities. Now, emissions, as you'll see from this next graph, uh, in green, we've got agriculture, and agriculture is not yet engaging with reducing greenhouse gas emissions. 
the energy sector, particularly moving away from coal-fired uh, power stations, has brought a dramatic reduction in the uh, emissions of greenhouse gases from the energy sector. Now, there's a lot of misunderstandings and misconceptions with relation to carbon, carbon sequestration, and the carbon cycle. The facts have been grossly oversimplified, and collectively, we need to inform where government policy needs to be driven. Public debate is frequently dominated by silos of self-interest at present. Farming is frequently vilified and is a tough, soft target for the media. But remember, as farmers, you have a resource and you are an, al an ally in climate change. Uh, there are opportunities for transformational changes to reinvent ourselves, to improve as an industry, to adapt technology and land management practices. Agriculture needs to take responsibility to share data in a transparent and holistic way and to demonstrate in a constructive manner where and why we're improving. Farming needs to embrace the science and the measures of things that are being done properly. Knowing about a problem is the first step in, in dealing with it. There's often an oversimplification between uh, carbon footprinting and the carbon cycle. Fundamentally, nitrogen and carbon cycles are strongly interlinked. While carbon sequestration may be easy for all to understand, as you increase soil organic matter, so biological activity increases and nitrous oxide gas release is also increased. The other greenhouse gases are also worth consideration. Nitrous oxide is a powerful greenhouse gas with a global warming potential that is 298 times that of carbon dioxide. It's emitted from nitrogen-based fertilizer and animal wastes added to the soil, and once created, nitrous oxide stays in the atmosphere for an average of 114 years. Conversely, the other big greenhouse gas is methane. It's balanced more readily than carbon dioxide. It's got a global warming potential of 28 times that of carbon dioxide, but methane has a relatively brief half-life of 9.1 years in the atmosphere, or alternatively, it lasts for 12 years. So in reality, we know as agriculturalists that nitrogen drives productivity in agricultural systems, and yet it represents one of the biggest threats to sustainability on a planetary scale. The Scottish Government have brought together the Arable Climate Change Group, which will report in March 2021. And the Scottish Government on the 1st of December 2020 released a consultation on proposals for establishing a Scottish nitrogen balance sheet as a method for determining a baseline for nutrient use efficiency in Scotland. We currently live in a world where yield is delivered by external inputs and modern arable systems are good at producing food with agrochemicals and with artificial fertilisers, but can we transition to reducing inputs in a sustainable way without reducing farm incomes? The challenge will be balancing crop nutrient requirements whilst minimising losses to maintain a sustainable environment and economic benefits. The starting point for achieving a high nitrogen uptake efficiency is creating an environment that enables the roots of the growing plant to proliferate through the soil mass. In the near future, therefore, carbon footprinting will be driven by nitrogen use efficiency metrics. The amount of carbon exchange between the carbon pools of air, land and living things, rather than soil carbon uh, content itself, will be the critical factor in soil systems. Now, the most efficient way to reduce agricultural nitrous oxide emissions is to affect the soil properties through drainage, the application of appropriate soil tillage systems, improving the efficiency of nitrogen fertilizers with better placement, timing and rates of required nitrogen, then the growing of the relevant crops with high nitrogen uptake efficiency and growing cover crops. Now, the rates of nitrous oxide production are controlled by several factors. Soil water filled capacity or pore space, the oxygen availability, pH, mineral nitrogen, available soil carbon and temperature. And the denitrification becomes important as the soil water content greater than 6% water filled pore space due to a decrease in oxygen supply. This gives us a disaggregated distribution in relation to nitrous oxide release uh, with respect to annual rainfall patterns across the country and the emission factor governed by nitrogen application rate. 
management practices such as tillage systems and fertilizer applications can significantly affect production and the consumption and the, the consumption of uh, nitrous oxide because of the alteration in soil physics chemical and biological properties fundamentally however resilient soils can adapt more readily to variation if we get our soil husbandry right we bring together the conditions that create the opportunity to deliver yield now in 2019 most people will remember it was a very wet winter and the start of the spring was wet by leaving the land on the uh, spot farm in stubble in during the winter it retained the poor channels connectivity and the land drained more rapidly in the spring and a class 960 axion uh, 445 horsepower with a sumo trio was used instead of plowing on the land um, on the hdb spot farm i believe there is a place for all tillage techniques and embrace a flexible cultivation policy for what is right in each field i would strongly argue against any policy that penalizes or restricts the ability to use inversion tillage there's no advantage of carbon sequestration with the use of no-till or reduced till compared to conventional ploughing, the potential to accumulate carbon through the whole soil profile under no-till or reduced tillage systems is limited compared to conventional ploughing. Now, in this scenario of using the trio, the straw was kept on the, the, the soil surface and the ridge profile was kept open and it was easy to operate the harvester at the end of the season. If a mistake was made, it was not applying glyphosate to control the annual metagrass prior to, to using the Sumo Trio. The deep beds were then pulled up uh, from the field before planting uh, took, took place. And Jim Reed chose to use Yara Complex Fertilizer E12-11-18 with 20 SO3. It's long been appreciated that the form of uh, K application for example, a sulfate or chloride has a significant impact on tuber quality traits, but it's less well known that there are also effects on canopy size and structure. The application of K in chloride form from muri to potash leads in comparison to sulfate or potash to a lower osmotic potential in crops as the osmotic active chloride is accumulated in high amounts in MOP rather than in SOP. This subsequently leads to higher water uptake and a correspondingly higher vegetative growth. Higher vegetative growth rates, particularly of the above ground part of plant, lead to an increased competition for assimilates between shoots, tubers, as the shoot has a strong sink for such assimilates. There is additional evidence suggesting that the chlorine ions play a specific signaling role in the stimulation of leaf cell growth. Larger and more turgid cells give rise to leaf tissue with a higher capacity for water accumulation, which is also evidenced by a greater leaf thickness and succulence in chlorine treated plants. The corollary to this is that seed crops treated with sulfate of potash keep the crop much more erect. Uh, so we've got that in the uh, Yara Myla complex fertilizer. It's easier to inspect, it's easier to rogue, and ultimately, if the, the farmer is using a flail, um, it's much easier to obtain a clean chop. The ridge that was obtained uh, at planting time, we can see here, we've got a, a beautiful ridge shape and there's lots of straw there contained within the ridge profile to keep it nice and open and minimize uh, soil saturation and uh, minimize powd powdery scab. What was interesting is that this uh, core image taken from a stitched satellite, um, sorry, stitched drone imagery, or taken on the 17th of June, clearly shows the legacy effect of deep soil compaction from high axle weight loads conducted in the previous winter wheat crop. And the direction of travel in the wheat, winter wheat crop was perpendicular to the direction of planted potatoes. The pattern of slower plant emergence seen between the two white lines is repeated down the, the photograph at six meter intervals as we go down, down the field. Now, moving subject again on to aphids and virus management, IPM is an integrated multi-layered approach 
which includes a number of tangible measures, as well as attitudinal and husbandry behaviours, which in combination can form an effective approach to crop protection. IPM is not a single pest or disease control method, but rather a series of management evaluations, decisions and controls. It must start with the foundation, agronomic practices, which are likely to reduce pressure rather than completely eliminate any pressure. Increasing pesticides are not always effective when used as a singular control tactic. Now, growing virus-free seed should be straightforward. Using virus-free input seed, growing resistant varieties, growing away from sources of infection, and growing in the absence of vectors. That's all easier said than, than done in practice. It is possible to increase the protection of potato fields against PVY by a greater understanding of the biology and ecology of PVY spread and by combining control strategies with different modes of action that complement each other, such as mulching, oil spraying and the use of wildflower strips. In Scotland, although we produce high quality seed, there has been a, an increase in the level of mosaic virus from a very low base. The seed area not holding grade due to mosaic virus increased in 2020 to 5% of the seed area entered for inspection, up from 4.7% recorded in 2019. For the crops not holding grade due to mosaic virus, 95% were infected with PVYN. Now, minimising the impact of PVY in potato seed crop requires a two-pronged approach. You have to control minimising PVY inoculum in the seed and reducing the spread of PVY in the field. But fundamentally, one of the factors with the largest effect on minimising PVY levels is planting seed with the lowest level of virus level, levels possible. All seed crops in Scotland are inspected twice during the growing season by qualified and experienced inspectors for the visual expression of virus relative to certification tolerances. But there have been changes over time with respect to PVY strains. Previously, PVYO had obvious field symptoms and was effectively managed by the Scottish Seed Potato Classification Scheme. There are three reasons why this is no longer the case. PVYN and recombinant strains of PVY have spread notably the PVYN strain, which expresses foliar symptoms poorly and may easily go undetected. Asymptomatic cultivars have also grown in popularity. That means we cannot see the, the virus in these plants. And late season infection has risen due to loss of insecticides and desiccants, slowing down home destruction and allowing more frequent regrowth. And we know from work done on the spot farm that there can be late ingress of PVY and leaf roll into the crop at the point of desiccation, if desiccation isn't uh, effective. Visual observations are therefore becoming a less effective method of assessing plant health, making it more difficult to prevent the increase in virus by inspection alone. Now, in Scotland, PVY is known to be spread in fields mainly by non-colonising aphids. The strongest relationship with PVY in transmission in Scotland is produced using the mean suction traps, trap catches of rose grain aphid, grain aphid, and bird cherry oat aphid prior to the 29th of July, together with the incidence of PVY in the previous year. For 2021, the prediction from SASA of the crop area containing at least one plant with PVY is 13.3%. Now, coming back to insecticide use, pyrethroid insecticides have been relied upon for many years for the suppression of non-persistent mosaic viruses, as they have provided historically a rapid knockdown of aphids and minimized the spread of uh, mosaic viruses. But despite the intensive use of pyrethroids, their effectiveness in controlling PVY spread is now considered to be poor. Peach potato aphids, and potato aphids have resistance to pyrethroids. And more recently, testing has uncovered sensitivity shifts to pyrethroids with the willow carrot aphid. The willow carrot aphid is capable of transmitting both PVY and PVA, 
in relation to PVY, its transmission efficiency is at least 50%, up to over 100% as efficiently as peach potato aphids, and occurs in large flights early in the year when potato plants are young and susceptible to transmission. Now, this is a dose response uh, chart uh, from Steve Foster at Rothamsted. It shows a clone of willow carrot aphid collected from cow parsley in North Yorkshire by Larissa Collins in May 2014. And Steve was hoping this would provide a susceptible baseline, which would have moved these blue points you can see here on the screen further to the left. But as you can see, um, there were subsequently found to be resistant to lambda salahethrin. It's important to remember that this is a top glassy and therefore is broadly equivalent to field application rates. But as we can see here, samples sent in over the period of 2018 and 19, they all sit neatly on top of the that initial sample from, from Ferra, suggesting that there is no variation and there is evidence that there are resistant forms here. The extent that of this resistance mechanism in the UK was uh, and is uh, unknown, but is suspected to be widespread. As we can see, the other susceptible clones of Satobi Novini and of Mysis Persky, the these are shifted to the left. And the thing about the willow carrot aphid is that they do not appear to show a considerable shift to what we consider to be a susceptible baseline. And this creates a problem in controlling willow carrot aphids with pyrethroids in the GB. So we must consider willow carrot aphids now not to be controlled by pyrethroids. Most of the grain aphids carry super KDR genetic mutation, which enables them to survive field rates of pyrethroids. To further complicate matters, pyrethroid resistance has recently been discovered in Ireland in the bird cherry oat aphid. So, the majority of new cases of insecticide resistance in the UK is to pyrethroids, which is likely to be due to our long-term over-reliance on this class of insecticides. Continuing to spray pyrethroids on a seven-day interval to seed crops for virus is having a negative effect on beneficials. PVY is transmitted by winged aphids in a non-persistent way, characterised by rapid virus acquisition when the aphids probe infected leaves and then rapidly we see transmission occurring within 10 to 15 seconds without a latency period when it moves to another plant and the aphid probes again. Moreover, PVY is known to be mainly spread in potato fields by non-colonizing aphid species. And although mature plant resistance makes a very useful contribution to control of PVYO, it does not apply to PVYN. The industry has wrongly inferred the knowledge historically of PVYO to PVYN, and we now know PVYN is, is dominant. As a result, the industry is massively underestimating PVYN late risk in the season after second inspection. We've also got to remember that there is no isolation of potato seed crops from weir fields in Scotland, or indeed from carrot fields. Therefore, isolation of seed fields is difficult, if not, or impossible to, to achieve. Now, if we consider varietal propensity, this is a term that reflects the susceptibility of a variety to disease or virus species. And when looking at varietal propensity, the strain of virus is as important as the variety because visual expression is dependent on the virus strain and varietal propensity data is derived from samples submitted during crop inspections by department inspectors. It is useful for targeted action, but with one important reservation referred to as varietal honesty. If you've got asymptomatic expression of a virus in a variety, you cannot see it, then it will not be picked up in this varietal propensity table. Now, the HDB spot form has been looking in much more detail into alternative approaches using mulching, crop borders, intercropping with wildflower strips, and the use of mineral oils. Scotch agronomy were part of a three-year project investigating aphid and virus transmission in seed crops published in 2013. Scotch agronomy then led a further three-year HDB project on mineral oils published in 2015. 
Canada, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands all use mineral oil all the way through the season. We have a restriction in the UK that mineral oils cannot be used beyond tuber initiation. But why has Scotland ignored the facts and retained the comfort blanket of ineffective pyrethroids over the last seven years? The use of mineral oil is an effective way to protect seed crops against the spread of PVY, although we must admit that the protection is incomplete and needs to be augmented by implementing additional control techniques. It operates best if you've got clean seed being planted within a field. It's not a hospital. It doesn't make dirty seed cleaner or, or better. Now, work in France and in Belgium has shown that sprays of systemic insecticides together with mineral oil can improve PVY and leaf roll control. Growers who start at 30% emergence, reducing the interval to three days for the first two, three sprays, and continuing weekly with mineral oil until tuber initiation have the greatest control of PVY. It's long been recognized that aphids are preferentially attracted to light reflected from soil in blank beds and the contrasting neighboring plants, as you can see here in the right hand uh, picture. Thus, introducing ground cover into these situations of blank beds or separation strips can prevent landing strips for aphids, as well as increasing natural predator populations. Additionally, using straw mulch or drilling spring barley into these blank beds is a practical mitigation technique for early generation FG2 or FG3 seed growers with a disproportionately high number of separation zone between the numerous seed stocks. Now, Cereal purge strips or spring barley borders are readily adaptable to current production practices, and we used those on the spot farm in 2020. Although the greatest benefits in reducing PVY instance are likely to occur in smaller blocks of pre-basic seed potatoes. Where aphids first land in the surrounding cereal crop, this cleans the aphid stylet of PVY and other potiviruses, including PVYO, PVA, uh, and PVV, before they further fly on into the seed crops. Now, looking at uh, straw mulch, uh, straw mulch applied between 2.5 and 3.5 tonnes per hectare. The effect of the straw mulch is primarily attributed to the effect on the host finding behaviour of aphids. The contrast between potato foliage and yellow straw is considerably lower than potato foliage and bare soil, so that potato plants in most plots are less easily seen by aphids. However, its effect on vector declines rapidly as the crop cover increases and therefore the mulch isn't protecting against late vector migration. It shouldn't be difficult using a trailed uh, teagle straw chopper to apply 3.5 tonnes per hectare of chopped straw so that the separation system on the harvester is not blocked. The additional challenge will be looking at the timing of residual herbicides before adding, adding the straw. Wildflower strips on crop trim lines or in an extra bed between the boom tips creates corridors throughout the crop as part of an integrated pest management system. It can reduce aphid-borne virus mid to late season, but it is important to remember that there is a lag phase in the, the effectiveness of this technique. Increasing biodiversity in a move away from monoculture system and its high reliance on chemical controls is seen to be beneficial moving into the future. A pilot project was carried out at the HDB Strategic Seed Potato Farm at Murphy in Angus and also at Bulgonia Estates in Fife. Each farm established strips of cover crops in the tram lines within a single potato field. We established that while flower strips could be drilled on or between the tram lines and not be killed when the herbicides were applied to the remainder of the, the potato field. Additionally, uh, Desiree Makeda, as part of our PhD project with Gaynor Malach from EHI, were investigating endosymbionts and genotypes of potato aphid, macrocyphum euphobiae. Now, endosymbionts are simplistic gut bacteria and we're interested in the relationship between these gut bacteria and their influence on the aphid relationships with parasitoids. Aphids are frequently engaged with mutualistic association with these gut bacteria or endosymbionts, 
and the symbionts are uh, obligate within the aphids. And research has shown that the symbionts have numerous effects on the host behavior of the aphids, such as resistance to parasitoids. This symbiotic relationship may affect, be, be affected by several factors, such as the ability of the endosymbionts to spread between aphids within, within the crop and across populations, and the cost of infections for the host. Interactions may be affected by aphids living within the environment, such as the host feeding behavior, and hence our interest with its relationship with wild flower strips. Now, this was part of a joint project carried out with Max Newbert and Belinda Bailey of Syngenta, Kings, and the Game Wildlife and Conservation Trust, together with ASDA. All are key partners in this project and so need to be recognized. But I want you to look at the number of parasitic wasps and lace wings, which uh, will all uh, actually predate aphids. And this next data demonstrates that there is limited distance that the predator species will travel. Therefore, the need to link corridors through potato fields at regular intervals, either at 24, 28 or 36 metres on your tram lines or between your tram lines, that join with the permanent features on, on the headland. Thus, there is a requirement to think about the whole system and the rotational approach to IPM, not just within the potato fields. The last thing is easier home desiccation uh, and sorry, earlier home desiccation will limit the spread of PVY and potato leaf roll. Reducing the growing season can severely limit and reduce yield, but there should not be any dual purpose seed crops any longer, as you're only permitted to apply one application of insist or topiki to a wear crop. Consequently, seed potato producers must make a judgment between seed potato yield, the tuber size, and the virus risk. Killing the foliage before plant maturity reduces gross tuber weight, but this is not an intractable problem since the production of smaller sized tubers and tuber number, replantable hectares, is the primary aim of certified seed production. I will leave you with a summary of these actions. Urgent action does need to be taken with respect to certified seed production. It's not a finger pointing exercise, but sometimes change is needed for the better for all. There are clearly knowledge gaps and we collectively need to explore vector pressure, late season control of virus and the challenges of desiccation, climate change and much, much more. All the pieces of the jigsaw are in front of us, but until someone's put it all together, it's difficult to see the whole picture. In biological systems, impacts are generated over time through dynamic and complex processes. The first step is crucial to ensure the change is successful. I now want to finish with our, our work on desiccation. And you can see here the fully replicated and randomized uh, desiccation trial funded by HDB on, on the spot farm. It was planted by Jim Reed using a commercial planter. That's why the, the ends of the plots aren't absolutely square, but um, it was a practical situation. We noticed in planting back the seed from the 2019 desiccation trial that there was a significant difference in the amount of potato leaf roll virus in the 0.17 hectare plots of daisy that we planted back. Now, this shouldn't come as a surprise because Trevor Woodford in 1994 indicated that the virus transmission by insects is a highly variable process because it involves interaction between virus, vector, and the plant. Peach potato aphids, as a vector of leaf roll, uh, infect potato plants over non-infected plants, and this relies primarily on olfactory cues rather than on visual cues. Trevor Woodford, also working at SCRI in those days, uh, now GHI in 1985, showed that delaying infector removal by just eight days in July increased the spread of leaf roll to neighbouring plants from 2.3% up to 8.3%. So we shouldn't forget the, the lessons of, of history. HDB uh, hosted the replicated uh, desiccation trial uh, here at, at Murphy and a treatment list was repeated at other spot fo uh, farm sites on, on ware crops throughout the, the, the UK. 
but fundamentally important and linking back to a point that Jim Reed has made in other webinars is the application work and the principles of application, application, application. All desiccation products in the strip assessments on the spot form were applied through a commercial sprayer. But the components of control of product, timing, nozzle choice and operator, only 50% of the control actually comes from the product and this is often forgotten by uh, practitioners the timing and nozzle choice and the skill of the operator is fundamentally important in a change from 2019 where in 2019 we're using the guardian uh, air twin nozzles at, at t1 followed by the defy 3d uh, nozzles we in 2020 used the lechler IDTA 120.04C nozzles. The cost of a set of nozzles is about 570 quid for 60 nozzles. Uh, and there's clearly there are 56 nozzles at 0.5 meter spacing on Jim's 28 meter uh, spray boom. The key principles are, of spraying are product choice, 5.5 kilometers per hour forward speed, boom stability, boom height at 50 centimeters, and applying 400 litres per hectare of water volume. That means using a flow rate of 1.84 litres per minute at four bar pressure. Uh, and we know that these nozzles are effective uh, between 2.1 and four bar. They're rated as lead up three star nozzles for drift reduction. Now the IDTA flat fan jet is an asymmetrical uh, spray angle and flow rates. It's got a 30 degree angle in the front jet uh, relative to the perpendicular and a 50 degree rear angle relative to the perpendicular. The front spray angle is 120 degrees, giving 60% of spray volume with finer droplet spectrum to the front in driving direction for in the driving direction for optimum wetting. The rear spray angle is 90 degrees, giving 40% of the spray volume with coarser, more drift re resistant droplets. Remember that larger droplets in the rear have a velocity and momentum to penetrate the canopy and are less likely to be caught in the air turbulence or vortexing behind the sprayer. It probably will be interesting in 2021 to look at the Syngenta 3D90 nozzle, which is uh, under development and will be released in 2021. So that's a, a progression we're wanting to look at. Within the, the, the crop, uh, we did our desiccation work on the strip trials in Maureen on the 31st of July. Now, Maureen is a group three um, vigorous indeterminate crop. 84 kilograms of nitrogen were applied, 700 kilograms of a 12, 11, 18 with 20 SO3, and this provides 140 kilograms of SO3. And as I mentioned previously, we believe that the sulfate of potash is keeping the crop more active erect, making it easier to rogue and inspect. The crop also had 10 litres per hectare of MAGFOS K at T1, and um, it was planted at 77,500 tubers per hectare using 3045 seed planted on the 2nd of May. Each of the 0.2 hectare strips has an order of 15,500 tubers planted at a spacing of 14.1 centimetres on 1.83 bed width at 72 inch beds so it does give a true reflection of current practice with lots of replication within uh, the the plants within the 0.2 hectare strips but it wasn't replicated now flailing can disrupt soil and it can increase soil erosion if heavy rain occurs shortly after flailing Damage to soil structure where the flail had been used led to more clod formation and the use of more aggressive cleaning settings on the harvester in 2020. Wheeling compression damage to the ridge shoulders caused slabs of soil to enter the primary harvester web, requiring more agitation with consequently more tuber damage and a slower forward speed on, on the harvester. Now the, the flail uh, here, uh, was using diesel at the rate of 32 litres per hour that was 9.7 litres per hectare and it, the work rate was 3.4 hectares per hour on the, the flail. You can see here the differential flailing treatments within the, the, the trial series. Uh, each was three beds wide with a buffer bed between each of the, the treatments. 
I'll just give a couple of examples. Uh, treatment number one, chemical only, one litre of Spotlight Plus and Infinito, followed by 0.8 litres of Gozai and 0.6 of Spotlight Plus uh, and Infinito, followed by 0.5 of Gozai and 1.5 litres of Toil. Treatment four was uh, Flail with no pretreatment, uh, followed by one litre of Spotlight Plus and Ranman Top, followed by 0.6 of Spotlight Plus and, and Ranman Top. And you can see the difference in the price of the two treatments. Where we flailed, that was £151 per hectare. Where we use chemical only, it was £129 per, per hectare. And this uh, nice uh, stitched drone image shows the huge amount of work undertaken the site with differential treatments by, by Jim. So I take my hat off to Jim. It was a very busy season. Sadly, nobody got to see the site other than relatively few people because of COVID and social distancing but we collected a huge amount of data. The growth uh, and regrowth assessments on the 18th of August, that was 19 days after the first treatment. Treatment number two is pelagonic acid, which was the last, uh, last year was the slowest to act in the leaves, but this year with the aid of a mechanical roller pushing the crop over as a pre-treatment, what was the slowest treatment last year with the addition of a mechanical solution was actually one of the best. Also note the regrowth in each of the flailed treatments, which were treatments three, four, five, and six. Each of these flailed treatments without a pre-treatment pre actually gave strong regrowth. Treatment number 10 was actually a flail treatment, but it had a pre-treatment of Spotlight Plus, and there was no regrowth in treatment number 10. So no pre-flailing treatments were the only ones in which regrowth occurred. And the regrowth was quickly infested with uh, potato aphids uh, and peach potato aphids and subsequently brought a, a risk to, to, to virus, as you can see here in this, uh, this last image. Now, some of the experimental desiccation treatments were assessed were pelagonic acid and amino acid or carbon-based organic compound. It's a weak acid and it's registered for other purpose purposes in the UK as, as phenylsan. We also looked at salt or brine mixes, either sequenced by Spotlight Plus, uh, but both applied at T1, or brine solution applied on its own at 562 litres per hectare. The efficiency of pelagonic acid is highly dependent on application technique. Hitting the underside of the leaf is important. In 2019, the area between the wheelings were desiccated much faster, as you can see here on this left-hand side image. In 2020, Jim Reed ran the, the tractor up and down each bed with a homemade tilter on the front hydraulics, and we got a much more even and rapid desiccation achieved with the pelagonic acid as a, as a result, and it was one of the, one of the best treatments uh, actually undertaking this technique. All of these treatments have had a follow-up with 0.8 litres per hectare of gozai in toil, and the final treatment being applied. Subsequent scores showed the brine followed by spotlight was one of the fastest uh, senescing on the site. So emphasizing that uh, application technique and mechanical solutions are just as important as the chemical choice itself. Yield differences, there were no yield differences on the site. It's a limitation of split field comparisons versus small plot work. There were slight differences in the planted tuber numbers, but emphasize there were no yield differences that were discernible between the treatments. So most of the treatments actually worked well. I'll just give you a, a brief summary of our take home messages from that. Every season is different. Every crop is different. There is no one size fits all. It's all about having a footprint on the ground and understanding the crop and the treatment limitations. There's a greater need for flexibility in seed inspections. It's possible to get early first inspections by department inspectors, but um, it's very difficult to get early second inspections, which inevitably leads to tubers in some scenarios being oversized with limited value, um, other than planting that larger uh, tuber sizes back on, on your own farm. Working out approximate lifting date and counting back at least 28 days to ensure complete desiccation and skin set, that's going to be important in Scotland with cooler conditions, with less sunlight and more vigorous crops as seed crops. It does take four and sometimes over five weeks for complete desiccation. 
Pre-treat with a PPO inhibitor such as Spotlight if flailing a vigorous variety to minimize growth. If you're flailing, ensure the flail machines are in good condition and machine is set at the right height and that forward speeds are correctly controlled. When flailing crops, it's important to leave a stem length of about 20 centimeters to provide a good target area, free from as much leaf and uh, mulch as, as possible, with the flailed material being deposited into the trough away from the stem. I offer this flowchart of desiccation um, decisions as an approach, either as a chemical only or as a flail and chemical technique. So you can make a decision whether you've got uh, a flail available and how vigorous a crop is, and that should lead you through the uh, a flow chart of decision-making processes. If you are flailing only, we would recommend, as I mentioned, going in in a vigorous crop with a pre-treatment of uh, Spotlight Plus. Fundamentally, there is no blueprint. Each crop and field situation needs to be assessed differently with the most appropriate treatment chosen. We need to continue to develop non-mechanical desiccation methods to facilitate vigorous home desiccation when the soils are wet and when there are seasons when we can't go through with flails. Passive bulking does require T1 treatments to be applied between seven and three days earlier than that where we're used to going through with diquat previously. Clearly now diquat is revoked to, in order to maintain a target yield within the target saleable size fraction. There is no value in tops now because if you've been applying uh, multiple insecticides of systemic insecticides to a seed crop, it cannot be sold as a wear crop. It is essential to maintain late blight and virus protection on the crop until complete desiccation of all green material. Now, I'll leave you with this image of uh, Jim undertaking a harvest on the spot farm. You can see the uh, the tubers there, the seed tubers that were being lifted out of the field were like apples. Um, it was a great season. Sadly, more people were not able to see this site, but I will end there and welcome discussion with Jim Reed and myself in the next session. Thank you very much.